So this is the last class of the semester, and in this class we're going to discuss cybersecurity. Cybersecurity is a pretty important new area, but as we will uh, learn, it is a combination of new ideas. There are some new questions that have arisen, especially in the wake of 2016, and the kinds of attacks that we saw then, and some very old ways of thinking about the world, including many of the ideas about deterrence that we have already covered in some detail, and which can be applied in some important ways in order to understand the specific problems that we face with cybersecurity. What I'm going to do then is I'm going to go through this in order. And I'm going to go through this by explaining how it is, first of all, that we think about deterrence defense and something that we haven't talked about really to date which is deterrence by denial and how they work in cyber security during peacetime so if you think about this during peacetime you know, if you're a person who is concerned with cyber security you probably you may want to think about the offense uh, but you're also going to have a primary interest in trying to prevent various forms of attacks by outsiders, which could uh, have uh, consequences for your security, even if they do not necessarily involve the direct kinds of attacks that you might uh, you might expect in a wartime environment. So you might, for example, want to uh, try and prevent actors from trying to infiltrate your servers to steal your secrets. You might want to try to prevent them from committing subtle forms of sabotage, which might afflict you later, and so on. And here the options that you have, as I say, are threefold. First of all, you can think about using traditional deterrence, and you can think about whether or not this works for cybersecurity. Secondly, you can think about defense. You can think about how it is that you can defend your systems against attack. And finally, you can think about something which is a kind of a midway concept between the two, which is in a sense using defense for deterrent purposes, and this is deterrence by denial. And I'll explain how deterrence by denial works later on in the lecture. However, you also may want to think about offense, and you may especially want to plan for what kinds of offensive uh, actions you might want to take in a situation of war, and you might also want to think about covert action of one sort or another. So uh, offense here might be um, sort of direct attacks of one sort or another using cyber. And here you probably want to think about how they intersect with conventional kinetic attacks. And kinetic is a kind of a, uh, a jargon word for uh, talking about attacks which involve physical violence. And so the question then is how does cybersecurity and conventional uh, physical uh, attacks how do they work together in a wartime situation? And you also might want to uh, think about how you can use cybersecurity even when you cannot use a kinetic attack. You might want to use a cyber attack as a kind of a substitute for a kinetic attack under certain circumstances in order to achieve certain kinds of covert actions. And again, covert action is a kind of a jargon word for secret uh, forms of attack or secret forms of activity, which aren't just spying, but which are trying to change the situation in another country uh, so as to better uh, improve your security. So these are the kinds of standard problems that people have been thinking about in the realm of cybersecurity for the last 10 or 12 years. But in the wake of the uh, Russian hacking operations and other operations since, since 2016, we've begun to think about a different set of problems, and I will talk about these towards the end of the lecture, and that is the relationship between cybersecurity and democracy. So if you think about how democracy works from the perspective of cybersecurity, then you might come to some very, very very pessimistic conclusions, because democracy is supposed to be a fundamentally open system. If you want to have democracy working well, it has to be in some sense as a kind of a trusting system, a system that allows people to engage in a variety of different political activities in a relatively open way. And then if you think that democracy is open to various forms of cyber attack, then you might worry very much 
about what the prospects for democracy are. And this, of course, is one of the reasons why we see such worry expressed by some people, but, but certainly not by everybody, about the potential uh, for further attacks, like what happened during the presidential elections in 2016, and what kinds of consequences that they might have for attacks going forward. But you also might think about this in a somewhat more I hesitate to use the word optimistic, but maybe a less pessimistic way. You might think about ways in which you could mitigate these kinds of attacks. And here you would want to turn to ideas from traditional uh, computer security rather than from international security. And I will talk about how you can use concepts such as attack surfaces and threat models in order to get a better understanding of how you might secure democracy against certain kinds of attack that, uh, that are going to be very, very difficult to deter or to defend against in the 100% uh, suitable ways that you might want to apply if you're thinking about this from a traditional national security perspective. First of all, let's that be a Democratic administration or a Republican administration, that you have been tapped on the shoulder and you are the person who is supposed to provide them with advice about how best to defend the homeland against a variety of cyber attacks. So more or less what you're going to have to do then is you're probably going to have to think about employing a combination of uh, three different possible options that you could have to secure systems. One is to use the ideas of Thomas Schelling and others and a comprehensive form of deterrence. And the idea here is that you would protect the homeland against cyber attacks by deterring them, by uh, making it clear to attackers that if they attacked, they were going to find themselves being punished in ways that would make them wish they had never attacked in the first place. Second way you can do this is through defense. And here what you do when you're defending is you're simply trying to make sure that whatever assets you have that you want to protect are going to be extremely difficult for the adversary to attack, are going to be very difficult for the adversary to get. And finally, something which is a combination of the two, and that is effectively using defense for deterrent purposes. And here the idea is pretty straightforward. If you're trying to deter somebody from attacking you, there are two different ways in which you could do this. One is you can make it clear and make it credibly clear that you are going to attack them back in ways that will make them regret what they have done, and this is traditional deterrence. The other way in which you can deter them is by securing your system so well that they know that the uh, likelihood of them being able to successfully attack you are uh, completely minimal, and under those circumstances they may just shrug their shoulders and give up. So these are the three standard tools that you might want to apply. But unfortunately, it turns out that none of these is entirely satisfactory. Let's talk first. So if you want to deter somebody, you really want, in a certain sense, as we discussed when we were talking about Thomas Schelling, you want to be able to convince your adversary that if they attack you or if they do whatever it is that you want to deter them from, that they are going to be punished to such a degree that it will not be worth their while to attack you in the first place. Now, there are some problems which go along with this, and I can say this as a parent. I'm a parent of two boys, and sometimes uh, when uh, one of the uh, two boys who I am a father of doesn't want to get into trouble, uh, they blame the other individual, they blame my other child. And sometimes I don't know enough in order to be able to tell which of them did it. Now, this is a very trivial example, although as it turns out, many of Thomas Schelling's uh, great ideas he got from uh, child rearing, so I guess I'm doing the same thing. But, uh, uh, but, but effectively, you can imagine this problem on a much larger scale happening with regard to cybersecurity. Because if you're engaging in a traditional kind of attack, a physical attack, say, for example, I want to invade another country, uh, that other country is going to have a pretty good idea that it is me who's doing the invading. So when my uh, tanks and my soldiers and my, uh, my, my ships start to bombard, 
the other country, uh, the uh, other country is going to know that it is me who is attacking them. And then if the other country has a sufficient deterrent tool, perhaps they have nuclear weapons, then they are going to be able to deploy those nuclear weapons against me. And I, thinking down what are going, uh, all of the possibilities of what are going to happen, I'm going to decide that it isn't worthwhile attacking this other country, and hence I will be deterred. But a key part of this is that the other country knows that it was me who was attacking them. If you imagine uh, in a world where there were uh, hundreds of different uh, people who had nuclear, who had uh, weapons and missiles, one sort or another, and it was impossible for me to tell who had attacked me, then I would have great difficulty in deterring them because it's very, very hard for me to credibly threaten that I'm going to hurt everybody else in the world if I get attacked. So uh, in other words, one of the key things that you want if you are going to be able to deter other actors successfully, you want to be able to identify the other actor who is doing something that you do not want them to do. Now, it turns out that this may be sometimes quite hard in cybersecurity. And this is what is often called the attribution problem, which is simply put a way of saying that it is very often somewhat difficult to attribute the attack to the attacker to figure out who in fact was mounting a particular attack. And there are a variety of reasons why this is so. If you are mounting an attack against the internet, uh, across the internet against an adversary, it may be possible to skip across a variety of servers. So I might, as a uh, hacker, I might uh, compromise a server in uh, Brussels, which I then use um, sort of I, to tap into a server in uh, Germany, which I then use to tap into a server in Indonesia, which I then use to uh, tap into a server in Greece, which I then use to tap into a server in the United States, which I then use uh, to, uh, to tap into Ukraine, until finally, uh, after having daisy chained this through a six or seven or nine or ten different servers, I finally launch my attack from uh, the final server and use it to attack China. Now the problem there is, if you're China, if you really want to figure out who is doing the attacking, it may be that you are going to have to trace back all through all of these different computers in order to figure out that it was me who was behind it all. Uh, and uh, that may turn out to be very hard. These computers may be located in different jurisdictions. Uh, some of them may be uh, difficult for you to hack into. So this means that it is possible to hide your traces much, much more easily for that kind of attack than it might be for a brute physical attack. Similarly, if you're trying to author malware, if you're trying to author a virus or a worm or a trojan or any of the other different programs that you can use to uh, compromise somebody else's system, uh, then uh, it may be difficult for uh, the uh, person who is attacked to identify who the author of the malware is. Uh, it turns out that there are forensic ways. Very often you can tell because uh, hackers tend to use the same code over and over and over, but sometimes it turns out to be really difficult, especially this is the case when somebody's hacking tools I get a spread on the internet as happened in a rather embarrassing way to the National Security Agency a few years ago when uh, somebody re uh, revealed one of their hacking toolkits and made it publicly available to everybody, then allowing a variety of other actors, including uh, perhaps some state actors as well as cyber criminals, to use these tools slightly modified for their own attacks in ways that make it really difficult to tell who is uh, causing a particular attack. So sometimes, of course, you may not know that you have been attacked at all. If uh, you are the victim of an especially successful cyber attack, which compromises your servers, which uh, allows somebody to sneak into your system and steal all your data without you realizing or to leave uh, behind uh, some uh, traps or some uh, back doors, which will allow them to uh, then uh, compromise your systems in the case of uh, out and out warfare, you may not realize that your systems have been compromised. Uh, you may not realize it ever, or you may not realize it until it is too late and you're in a wartime situation and suddenly your commu communication systems refuse to, refuse to work anymore. Now, all of this means that uh, very often it is difficult to detect the attack and it is difficult to figure out who the attacker is. And all of this makes conventional deterrence much more difficult. Because as Schelling emphasizes, conventional deterrence is all about knowledge. 
It's all about creating uh, shared expectations in your adversary, that your adversary knows that uh, your adversary is going to get punished if they attack you in certain kinds of ways. And if your adversary thinks that you may not be able to identify them, or if your adversary thinks that you may not even know that you've been attacked, then the deterrent force of any threats that you can make uh, are going to be much weakened. Now, the United States does claim that it has partly solved these problems, and it certainly has shown itself capable of detecting the sources of a number of important attacks in the last few years. Uh, but it's very, very hard to be sure that the United States is uh, telling the truth on this, because uh, the United States would have an incentive to lie even if it was not particularly good at tracing back attacks, because uh, by lying it might be able to, to deter some attacks uh, that otherwise would occur by uh, creating the fear in the attacker that they would be detected and that bad things would happen to them. So this is one level of uh, knowledge which makes, in a sense, uh, it makes it difficult to uh, use conventional deterrence in the world of cyber. And this is all about the attribution problem. But there are other ones besides that. Because as I say, you want to create shared expectations for deterrence to really work. And this means, for example, that you might want to uh, generate shared knowledge you, so that everybody, including the actor who you're punishing, knows that they are being punished, knows what they are being punished for, and everybody else knows what is happening, knows that this actor is being punished and is being punished righteously, so that everybody else uh, gets a sense of what your understanding of the rules of the road are. So if this works, you need to generate a certain kind of knowledge in the target of deterrence. You need to, to be able to uh, get the target of your deterrent action, uh, uh, the target who you are potentially punishing, you need to let them know how they are being punished, uh, what they are being punished for. And this turned out, again, to be relatively tricky for cyber. Because it, could, because it could be, for example, that something that you think is an invidious attack is, from the perspective of the uh, actor who's being targeted, is uh, not so much of an attack uh, at all, is just some standard sneaking around the place trying to figure things out. So that uh, one of the problems here, for example, is if you break into some highly secure server, which has a lot of uh, important stuff on it, it could be that you're breaking in just in order to uh, steal secrets, which is something that uh, states do to each other all the time. It could be that you're uh, breaking in in order to sabotage those, those servers uh, so that they uh, are compromised in wartime. And uh, if these are, for example, servers that are in another state's command and control system for nuclear weapons, this could be something which would be incredibly escalatory, incredibly likely to lead to confrontation. But the problem is that it's very, very hard, very often, uh, to tell what it is that you're doing. You, know, so you, you and your adversary may disagree, may, your adversary may not, you know, may, may incorrectly give you the impression that they're doing something much more uh, incendiary than in fact what they are doing. And more generally, there simply aren't the kinds of shared expectations, shared rules, shared understanding that these kinds of attacks are, are reasonable and acceptable, and those kinds of attacks are not acceptable. We have not even begun to start articulating what this is in the realm of cyber. And it is much, much harder to do in, uh, the, in, the, in cyber than in, for example, nuclear weapons, because nuclear weapons, you can gradate pretty straightforwardly. You can say that a nuclear attack is if it has a certain amount of kilotons or megatons associated with it, it's on a minor city or it's on a major city. All of these things are, uh, all of these features of attacks allow attacks to be calibrated as to whether they are more or less serious. And uh, various people can reach a rough agreement on which attacks are more serious or more problematic and which attacks are less uh, uh, serious and less problematic. But with cyber, you have all of these different tools, all of these different forms of hacking, all of these different cyber weapons, which subtly differ from each other in ways that are really hard to categorize and ways which are often really hard to predict. So it could be, and this has happened uh, uh, reportedly with the NSA, that the NSA thinks that it is just uh, 
hacking into a server in Syria in order to sneakily listen to uh, communications, but it accidentally does the wrong thing when it's in that server and it completely uh, knocks out the Syrian internet for a period of days. So it could be that your uh, what you think is an innocuous attack instead turns out to have very substantial strategic consequences, causing a lot of anger and hence causing a lot of disagreement and hence causing perhaps a lot of uh, a lot of confusion between uh, the uh, the terror and the deter the actor that they're trying to deter, with a no real agreement as to which acts uh, are ought to be punished in which kinds of ways, and hence the likelihood that actors may react appropriately or inappropriately. Now, this also uh, becomes more problematic again when there is an international uh, audience, so that one uh, you, you obviously want to try to. Uh, get uh, whatever adversary is attacking you to stop doing this and you want to be able to punish them but you also don't want to make it appear to the outside world as if for example you are uh, just punishing this innocent state that is uh, completely blameless so you want to be able to persuade the outside world you want to be able to persuade other states that if you for example you uh, punish uh, some other state that has attacked you in an egregious way that this punishment is warranted and merited because of what the other state did to you. Now, there are problems in doing that, again, to do with uh, the specific nature of cyber. So if, for example, some other state attacks you and you are able to, to detect that other state's attack upon you, this gives you tons of evidence about what the other state has done to you. However, you may not want to share that evidence with the outside world. Because if you do share that evidence, then it becomes easier for your adversary and for other uh, potential attackers out there to understand how you detected that particular attack and to figure out ways uh, that they might be able to, to uh, respond to your systems so as to make it less likely that, they could, that you can, uh, you can uh, spot and you can uh, gather data on and hence you uh, make it less likely to, that you can punish future attacks, that they can change their attacks in order to try and uh, immunize them against whatever systems you use to, uh, to spot that they were happening and, uh, and so on. And it's really hard to provide evidence to convince the outside world uh, that another state has attacked you without providing information about the methods that you have used to detect the other attacker. And there's a very practical example of this, which has to do with uh, the North Korean attack on Sony uh, movie servers a number of years ago, where effectively the North, uh, North Korean hackers hacked into Sony servers and revealed a lot of embarrassing information. And the United States, it was then the Obama administration, said that uh, this was an attack which had been mounted by North Korea and uh, then punished North Korea but it refused to say what information it had that allowed it to trace the attack to North Korea. And hence, a lot of other observers in the international realm didn't necessarily believe that the United States was telling the truth about North Korea. They thought that there was very possibly some other actor and that North Korea, which was already in the United States bad books, was just getting the blame. It turned out later, of course, that it was North Korea that had done this. And the reason why the United States was reluctant to reveal this was because uh, the United States had managed to hack into the uh, servers that uh, North Korea's own hackers were using to do stuff. They were able to watch everything that North Korean hackers were doing. But obviously the United States did not want to reveal this because if they revealed it, uh, it would then become possible for uh, North Korea to figure out what had happened and to shore up the vulnerabilities that allowed the United States to snoop on North Korea. This then creates all of these uh, various problems that Borkhardt and Lonergan describe. And you know, again, think about deterrence as a form of communication, because really what that is, every form of communication needs a, it needs a common language. It needs some languages which is relatively robust, in which meaning is reasonably clear and is reasonably well agreed upon. But the problem, as Borgard and Lonergan described with cyber, is that cyber does not have any common language like this. And this means that any incursions may be easily misinterpreted. People may, uh, the, the targets may interpret them in different ways from the attackers. And all of this can get complicated again by the attribution effect. So uh, in other words, it may be that uh, you do not know how some other actor is going to respond uh, to your attack. 
I they may I'm sort of view this as being a relatively innocuous attack. They may view it as being completely egregious. Uh, you and it may also be that your a sense of whether or not you uh, are going to be punished for attacking is going to be complicated by your belief that it is unlikely that the uh, target of your attack will be able to attribute it to you properly. And all of this means that deterrence is going to uh, not work particularly well. And, it, uh, and when deterrence doesn't work particularly well, when actors disagree profoundly about what is a relatively mild attack that you don't worry about and what is a very serious attack, then mistakes can happen very easily and these mistakes can lead to bad outcomes. So deterrence is going to be really, really hard. And Borgard and Lonergan give a few examples of how this might work. And they talk about critical infrastructure. Critical infrastructure here is a term of art. Critical infrastructure refers to the essential structures that you need uh, in order to run a system, in order to run a political, social, or economic system. And these are the things that you want to deter other attackers, foreign and nation attack attackers or others. You want to deter them from attacking. But the point that Borkhardt and Lonergan make is that you can imagine that there might be very, very different senses in different states of what critical infrastructure is. So that in the United States, for example, very plausibly, uh, the election system is part of critical infrastructure. This is something which is basic to the way in which the United States chooses leaders, uh, in which, uh, in which uh, policy gets set. All of this depends critically on elections. That may not actually be all that obvious to many foreign attackers. If you are in uh, China, or if you are in Russia, you may not necessarily appreciate all that well how crucially important elections are, because if you're Russian, for example, you have elections, but the reason that you have elections is more or less to provide some kind of a, a spurious legitimacy to the uh, party uh, that you uh, have already decided is going to win the elections, and also maybe to provide yourself with a little bit of information as to whether voters are relatively happy or relatively unhappy with your rule. So you won't think about elections as being this kind of sacred right of the body politic in the same way that many Americans would think of it. Equally, uh, US observers may have problems in understanding the sensitivity of other uh, countries' uh, critical systems. So if you're China, for example, you probably think of the Great Wall, these firewalling arrangements which make it uh, possible for China to, to control debate and to censor debate in its own uh, territory. You probably think of this as being a crucial part of critical infrastructure and you would view attacks upon this as being uh, very, very problematic. If you are a, a member of the US Senate or the US Congress, you may want to fund attacks on the firewall, uh, the Great Wall, because you think that this is a way of promoting freedom around the world and that this is awesome. Russia has sensitivities which has to do with the details of the financial arrangements of people who are at senior levels in the regime. This is uh, because uh, many people, uh, senior people in Russian politics, have made vast amounts of money uh, through uh, more or less problematic practices and they don't necessarily want this discussed in public. So one theory as to why it is that we saw the Russian attacks on the United States elections is that they might have been retaliation. They might have been retaliation where Russia was retaliating against these leaks of papers, the so-called Panama Papers, which uh, revealed all of these uh, international shell company arrangements through which extremely rich individuals were hiding their money, including some Russian people who were uh, very, very closely linked to the regime. It turns out, for example, that a uh, prominent classical musician in Russia, who is a very close personal friend of Vladimir Putin, somehow had billions of dollars, uh, which he had to save. And so there's a lot of speculation as to whether or not he was the front person for somebody else. But the point is that Russia might um, uh, plausibly may have viewed the Panama Papers attack which uh, effectively revealed information about how Russians and others were uh, hiding their money, they may have viewed this as being a kind of a, a vicious attack upon something that was a critical part of the Russian political system. And this may have led them to retaliate by being more willing to mount attacks on the uh, US uh, presidential elections. So here we can see plausibly how a lack of shared understanding, a lack of shared agreement as to what exactly is critical infrastructure could cause escalation. 
So in this possible story, it could be that the United States thinks that it is, uh, yes, that the United States, if the United States did indeed leak these papers, these Panama Papers, the United States thinks that this is a way of sending a warning to Russia and perhaps to other actors, that it is a, able to embarrass a senior people within Russia. Uh, it has the uh, goods on where the money is hidden. This uh, is treated by Russia as being a far more serious thing than uh, the U.S. expects. And so Russia, in turn, retaliates by interfering in U.S. elections, not understanding how a uh, problematic this is going to be seen as being, and this leads to a massive escalation and a deterioration in uh, relations between uh, the United States and Russia, which is likely to result in very extensive sanctions, uh, economic sanctions, one of these days. So then uh, you would say that, the pro that, that from given all of these problems, it looks like a standard deterrence is very problematic. It's hard to attribute attacks to figure out where they came from. It's sometimes hard even to detect attacks. It's hard to create the kinds of shared expectations among the uh, actor you're trying to deter and the actor who's doing the deterring for deterrence to work well. And you may have these uh, very plausible spiral situations where efforts to uh, punish may be misinterpreted and may lead to uh, counter-punishments counter which are uh, even harsher and which uh, may lead to a, a very rapid escalation because neither side understands the true sensitivity of the other side. So this all suggests there are some real difficulties with deterrence. Are those difficulties solvable? Well, ideally, you would try to solve them by creating some kind of shared understanding among states so that everybody would have a reasonably similar a compatible and comprehensible way of evaluating attacks and targets and understanding how the deterrent system worked. And this would allow uh, uh, you to avoid accidental escalation if you get there. And the US has been trying to do this over the last number of years. What it has been trying to do is it has been trying to persuade uh, other states that they should treat cyber attacks on the basis of what it calls an effects-based doctrine. In other words, that they should think about a cyber attack uh, in terms of the consequences that it has. And if these consequences are similar to some kind of a physical attack, say, for example, you do a cyber attack on uh, the uh, stock exchange in Moscow, which is equivalent to uh, blowing up the stock exchange in ways that would uh, make it impossible to uh, repair for a few months, then you can think about these attacks as being fundamentally equivalent, and then you can decide to deter based upon that. So that has the benefit of simplicity, and it also is something which has advantages for the United States with respect to kinetic attacks. Because there are many adversaries who the United States might have difficulty in attacking using a cyber attack because uh, their uh, information systems are too uh, minimal, are too primitive, or not important enough in society. Uh, so that, for example, if the United States ran a cyber attack on North Korea, which it has done occasionally uh, to uh, take down the North Korean internet, that's kind of like a slap on the wrist. But if the United States can persuade other states that it is appropriate to respond to cyber attacks with physical attacks uh, of equivalent effect, then that means that the United States has far more options when it is attacking uh, information poor adversaries because it can use physical attacks that they might find much more costly. But for exactly that reason, and for other reasons too, uh, other states have failed to agree with the United States on this. So there are other problems as well. Uh, there is, and the, the final problem I want to talk about is the problem of credible threats and deterrence. Because if you want to deter, you not only want to be able to identify the attacker and figure out who the attacker is and create all this shared knowledge, you want to be able to uh, identify some asset of the actor who you're trying to deter, which the uh, asset whom you're trying to, uh, which the actor whom you're trying to deter does not want to lose. So that, for example, you threaten that if uh, the uh, Soviet Union back in the Cold War, if the Soviet Union takes over, uh, takes over uh, uh, Munich, that you will then uh, bomb uh, Minsk or some other uh, uh, pretty important uh, uh, Russian city. And the Russians look at this, they decide that they might like Munich, but they like having Minsk a hell of a lot more and they refrain. But it's very hard if you want to use cybersecurity attacks, it's very hard to hold assets at, at risk in a predictable way. 
because uh, the uh, advantage of being able to uh, announce Minsk in the future and that you're going to use nuclear strikes against Minsk is that it's very, very hard for Minsk to defend itself against nuclear strikes. Because it is very, very hard to, start, uh, to stop an intercontinental ballistic missile. But in contrast, if you want to uh, deter an attack by, say, for example, announcing that you're going to uh, retaliate through a cyber attack on the Moscow Stock Exchange, uh, then you are giving information to your adversary that there is some vulnerability in the Moscow Stock Exchange that you are going to be capable of targeting, and this information may be sufficient to allow your uh, uh, allow the actor who you are trying to uh, deter a way to figure out what the vulnerability is and to shore it up so as to minimize your ability to uh, credibly threaten to attack them. Furthermore, uh, you uh, don't necessarily know that cyber attacks are going to work in the future. Uh, they always tend to be kind of messy because they are trying to attack these complicated computer systems, which sometimes respond in unexpected ways. Attacks, uh, cyber attacks, are often one shot in the sense that once you use them, uh, your adversary can analyze them and can defend themselves against such attacks in the future. So that means that they are quite expensive to deploy. And finally, you simply, and this gets back to the Syria point, you may end up uh, doing a very different amount of damage. If you do actually punish, an attack, uh, punish another country, you may end up doing a different amount of damage than you expected, either because your attack was much less successful than you intended, so it effectively fizzles out, or because, uh, which is equally bad and sometimes much worse, your attack may be much more successful than intended, so that uh, you do not realize the system you're targeting is a crucial key point of a broader network, and the entire network fails as a result of your attack, perhaps, you know, sort of, uh, say, for example, resulting in the uh, failure of a power grid and the deaths of hundreds of people in a heat wave or something horrible like that. All of this means standard deterrence theory, which relies upon credibility, relies upon shared knowledge, relies upon the ability to hold these assets at risk. It all turns out to be very, very difficult to do with cyber. So this should suggest that you might want to go to defense. You might want, rather than deterring, simply to, to defend your computer systems against outside attackers. Turns out that this is really, really hard to do. Again, there is a set of standard tools that allow you to do it. If you have a server, you probably want to have a firewall. A firewall is just simply a way of looking at outside access to the system and uh, trying to uh, both monitor who is trying to access the system and trying to prevent actors who are uh, not authorized from getting access to the internal parts of the system you're trying to uh, de defend. So firewalls often go together with network monitoring and with analytics that try either automatically or uh, through, um, you know, through uh, various other means to identify possible attacks that are occurring. It turns out, however, that uh, these do not necessarily work particularly well, uh, that they uh, very often are incapable of stopping even semi-sophisticated attacks, and network monitoring tends to throw out uh, either too, too, few, um, too few real positives or too many false positives, which is to say that it is hard to calibrate it so that it uh, focuses on threats, Typically, uh, you're going to find that either it is going to uh, not miss a whole bunch of threats, which are really important because it is too narrowly tuned. It does not, um, sort of, you know, it, it, it doesn't recognize the signatures of a lot of different attacks. Or else, alternatively, it is going to keep on going off, keep on identifying innocuous patterns of data tra transfer as being possible cyber attacks, so that you're basically going to uh, then turn it off and uh, forget about it because it is just too much of a nuisance to use. You can also use air gaps. Uh, you can try to separate your, your computer physically from any other network. This is uh, usually, although not necessarily, quite effective. But the problem is, of course, that if you separate it from the network, it is really hard to use it unless people are physically present. And you can also use cryptography plus permissions, which is a standard way of securing, uh, uh, securing assets within a server. Effectively, what you do is you make sure that the sensitive stuff is heavily and well encrypted uh, using codes which are really difficult to break and that can only be uh, decrypted by people who have the appropriate permissions and the appropriate passwords. All of these can help to make things a little bit easier to help prevent to some degree 
uh, cyber attacks from succeeding, but uh, none of them is anywhere near to being satisfactory. And as the uh, famous Republican James Baker, he is a famous Republican, said back in September 2013, the fundamental problem is that the internet, the system across which most of these different servers connect, is just not designed for security. It was designed in the early 1970s by a bunch of computer scientists who more or less trusted each other, who did not expect various forms of attack. And while the internet has evolved in many, many ways since then, it still has this kind of basic trustingness attached to it. You can uh, very straightforwardly connect a computer to the internet without anybody asking who you are. So from the perspective of national security, this suggests that the internet, which is this open trusting system, is a terrible system for security. And Baker says it is fundamentally and inherently flawed from a security perspective. And as a nation, we've tolerated the production, deployment, and operation of flawed device networks that process and transmit our most important information and operate our most vital national systems that we ourselves have connected to this horribly insecure system, which we call the internet. So this then means that uh, you are in a world, you are in a world where it is really, really hard to defend computer systems. It's hard to defend them uh, because of uh, because uh, they are mostly connected to the internet. It's also hard to defend them because uh, software, as we will discuss in a minute, the kinds of software that you use to run servers invariably has security holes and flaws, so-called zero-day exploits, which uh, other people can identify and use to break into your system. This then is interesting if we go back a little bit in the course to think about the questions of offense-defense balance and offense-defense distinguishability again. Because what we see here is that the internet, it turns out, seems to be pretty good at offense. Cybersecurity favors offense over defense. It's pretty easy to mount attacks, according to many people, and to get away with them. And it's very, very hard to defend effectively against all of these attacks. And the fundamental idea, we have already seen how the internet is flawed. And also it turns out that code, as I say, computer code is complicated. It is very patchy, very uncertain. There are lots and lots of people who write it. There are always bugs and flaws. There are different systems which work together in unexpected ways. So that there is a thriving market, as I say, in so-called zero-day vulnerabilities, which are basic uh, flaws in, uh, in, in, in operating systems or other commonly used software that can then be exploited by attackers. Furthermore, much of the key physical infrastructure of the internet is, uh, um, is poorly protected. It's owned by civilians. If we think about the power grid, if we think about the telecommunications network, the uh, United States does not actually run these, and certainly other countries don't do either. Instead, they're run by the private sector, and very often the private sector is less interested in protecting against a variety of attacks than it is in saving money. And finally, if you want to attack this stuff, uh, it's very cheap. It's highly expensive to defend. You have to spend a lot of money hardening your systems, getting experts to uh, come through the uh, source code for your software to make sure that there aren't any obvious bugs. This is all expensive and difficult. But if you want to attack, more or less what you need is you need a, a few reasonably good computers. Uh, you want to have a number of hackers and you want to have a lot of coffee and this allows you to uh, this effectively allows you to amount uh, potentially a relatively sophisticated cyber attack capacity. So you can run a, a cyber attack uh, team for uh, more or less the same amount of money as you uh, use to, I don't know, polish a wing on a bomber or something else uh, by the standards of Department of Defense procurement budget budgets, you are paying pennies for cyber. So uh, offense is really easy, attack is really cheap, defense is really hard. And so here we can say very plausibly, although some people disagree as we will go on to discuss, that cybersecurity plausibly favors the offense over the defense. Then we want to ask if we're interested in uh, how this affects security, we want to think about whether it is easy to distinguish offense from defense. 
and some aspects of defense are relatively straightforward to distinguish. If you think about firewalls, uh, which uh, most sophisticated computer systems have in order to try and prevent people from uh, gaining access, firewalls don't have any very obvious offensive purposes. You cannot use them easily to attack other actors. Uh, but there are other things which uh, you may want to invest in, which are very, very hard to tell whether you're investing in them for uh, offensive or defensive purposes. And the key example of this is people. If you want to hire somebody who is really, really good at attacking other people's systems, if you want to hire somebody for Cyber Command who is a really skilled and sophisticated hacker, uh, that the person who you hire is somebody who's going to be able to think out of the box. They're going to be able to get their way into the minds of the defenders, figure out what weaknesses the defenders may not have thought about, figure out what kinds of holes or flaws there may be in the defenses, and then ruthlessly exploit these flaws. What this means then is that uh, somebody who you hire as an offensive hacker is probably going to be potentially a pretty good defensive hacker too, and the opposite is true as well. A defensive hacker is probably somebody, a good defensive hacker, somebody who's very good at securing systems against attack, is going to be somebody who also is probably going to be very good at attacking because the two skill sets are largely complementary. If you want to be a good attacker, you have to be really good at thinking about the defense and thinking about how defenders think and modeling that. If you want to be a really good defender, you have to be really good at modeling how uh, attackers think and so on. So this then means that the major investments that you are making are probably, you know, you might be, be buying these uh, systems that people can practice on, these so-called uh, cyber ranges and whatever, but the major investments, much of these are going to be in, pe in people. Uh, in hackers who are sophisticated, you know, and these hackers, you know, could uh, you may be hiring lots and lots of them. You may claim that you're doing so purely for defensive purposes, but your adversaries are going to recognize that they can be used for adversarial purposes as well. That you claim you're hiring so-called white hat hackers, which are people who are devoted to defense, but these are also people who are going to be extremely good at offense as well, and they will very often practice doing both things through uh, so-called red team exercises exercises where half of a, a group of people are uh, designated, for example, as attackers and half as defenders in order to help them think through how attacks and defenses might work in real life. Mm -hmm. All of this means that we are in the bad box uh, from the point of view of offense and defense distinguishability and dominance. We are in the world where it is often quite hard to distinguish the defense from the offense and where the offense is dominant. And this, of course, is the world where peace is difficult to achieve, where expansion is easy, in the uh, more specific terms of cyber, attack is easy, and war is frequent, that is where uh, you can expect attacks to happen all the time. And this indeed seems to be the world that we are in. If you look at cyber, you see that uh, systems uh, that are left on the internet, that they are probed uh, Many, many times, if you have a, if you have something which is a, an obvious valuable target, you can expect it to come under more or less relentless attack from hackers trying to figure their way in. So this is a very dangerous uh, uh, a dangerous world, at least for the uh, kinds of dangers that we uh, classify as being dangerous in cybersecurity. You can expect to see a lot of offensive uh, uh, action happening during peacetime as well as war. And this is indeed the world that we see ourselves in. US defense policy is based upon this assumption. It starts from presuppositions about deterrence and offensive def offense defense balance. It starts from the basic case that we have made that deterrence doesn't work particularly well. Although it has changed somewhat in the uh, last few years, the Pentagon, as I say, has become at least more publicly optimistic that it is capable of stopping cyber attack than it used to be. And so a uh, US then assumes that there is a, that is going to be very difficult to deter. And it assumes that we are in the bad box of the uh, offense-defense distinguishability and offense-defense balance uh, two by two. 
And this uh, means in general that uh, if we are in this world, then this is a world in which it doesn't pay off to be restrained and in which arms control agreements aren't going to work, in which you cannot uh, trust that if you, for example, make an agreement with Russia, make an agreement with China to stop hacking, that they are really going to be very, very interested in uh, keeping their word on the stuff because the temptations to uh, cheat are just going to be too high. And then this leads to a lot of confrontation and a lot of spiraling of distrust uh, that we may expect that the United States then thinks that the best way to uh, get by this world is to be on the offensive much of the time in order to try to uh, in order to try and get what it can. Other countries are going to respond to this with offense as well, and we're going to see a lot of distrust and confrontation. Deterrence is going to be hard to achieve. Along the, It's going to be a very different world uh, from the uh, world of the Cold War. It's going to be very, very difficult to distinguish friends from foes, to figure out who are friendly and who are unfriendly actors in cyber, and the two may often uh, switch and swap around. And as I say, finally, it will be nearly impossible to build arms control treaties that states will actually abide by. If you think, for example, about a nuclear uh, Nuclear weapons treaties, they rely upon these inspection regimes, which are possible because it's usually it's reasonably hard to hide nuclear weapons. If you think about the various uh, treaties that have been concluded on the uh, movement of military forces to try and stop them from massing near borders, again, this is something which has been made possible primarily by satellite technology. If you have satellites and remote sensing, you can tell when troops are moving in ways that are contrary to the treatments, uh, treaties that their governments have signed. But with uh, cyber, it's very, very difficult to tell what governments are doing because they have a lot of plausible deniability. Uh, it is very, very easy to hide their hacking capabilities, uh, to uh, have private actors or criminals or others do some of their hacking for them. There are a lot of ways in which states can uh, figure out loopholes which make it very, very hard to hold them accountable or to say that this state is definitely doing this, that or the other. And this in turn makes it very difficult to build treaties that are really going to uh, provide any sort of stability. So here we see again that defense uh, doesn't work particularly well and that the fact that defense doesn't work particularly well means that we are in an offense dominant world with all of the problematic stuff that goes along with it. So how about deterrence by denial? How about the uh, notion that you can, you can try perhaps to uh, deter by building up sufficiently powerful and sufficiently sophisticated defensive capacities that other states simply aren't going to bother attacking you. Well, we see that this plays some role in US uh, uh, strategic policy. The United States, for example, has uh, by and large been, uh, it has been extremely enthusiastic to talk about how powerful its defenses are, to talk about how well-trained its defenders are, to emphasize the vast amounts of money that it spends on defense. It has been much, much more willing to talk about this than to talk about its offensive capacities. And the reason why it has been willing to talk about this is because by talking about this, it hopes that it may deter some attacks against it. And we see, how, uh, we see also that the United States tries to engage in a uh, programs of active defense, which of course are not only intended to defend, but also to uh, deter other attackers from, uh, uh, from attacking the United States. And this uh, involves a variety of programs, a variety of government initiatives, which seek to mitigate the risks of the insecure internet, uh, to monitor and test imported technology. This is something which is becoming much, much more important as the Pentagon begins to get uh, very, very uh, worried about the implications of international supply chains and where computer chips are coming from. There is an emphasis on active computer hygiene, on having air walls uh, or firewalls that should be, uh, that, that should be firewalls and air gaps rather than air walls and fire gaps. That's exactly the opposite way around. Uh, firewalls and air gaps to try and prevent uh, various forms of attack. And we see that this can work to some degree for military computers. So the, that uh, in general, the sense that one gets from talking to people in the cyber realm is that the uh, computers of the Department of Defense, which have the uh, .mil uh, name, just like .com goes for commercial enterprises, the .mil computers are reasonably well protected. But then it turns out that there are a lot of other government computers which are not so well protected, 
uh, that uh, these are the uh, computers that are under, under .gov, and some of them have some extremely sensitive information. So that, for example, a number of years ago, the Chinese, uh, Chinese hackers infiltrated and managed to get information more or less on every security clearance that had been granted by the United States for a substantial period of time, allowing them to figure out who was who within the CIA, within different parts of the uh, government that had access to classified information. So this, of course, was a huge disaster. And this was a .gov website, which it turned out was appallingly badly secure, given all of the uh, very, very crucial information that it held. And uh, the reason why is because it's really difficult to get all of the parts of this very sprawling federal government, let alone the state systems, the, the, the state systems at the level of the states, to get them to uh, coordinate upon shared policies and upon shared practices. It's very hard to defend them in the kind of comprehensive ways, and so it tends to be weaker. And the uh, relationship with the commercial uh, realm where again, as I say, there's a lot of important stuff out there, is extremely weak indeed. It is very, very hard even for the government to share certain kinds of information with commercial actors about possible threats because they worry about where this information is going to go, how this information may leak, and so uh, there is far, far less coordination between the government and the uh, private sector than you might expect in the realm of cybersecurity. There are special councils uh, which uh, bring the government and uh, some sectors together. The financial sector has been pretty effective but in general, uh, the commercial sector is uh, highly vulnerable to a wide variety of different attacks. So we find ourselves in a pretty miserable world. We find ourselves in a world where uh, offense, uh, uh, where offense is uh, dominant. We find ourselves in a world where traditional deterrence doesn't work particularly well where defense doesn't work particularly well, and where uh, deterrence by denial, seeking to use these defensive uh, capacities in order to scare other actors off, simply doesn't work. And we can see this just from the uh, huge number of attacks which are mounted against US government and commercial systems every day. All of this then has some important implications for policy. So it tells us that the United States places little uh, it places little reliance upon standard deterrence. The United States does not uh, pay much attention to standard deterrence in its uh, strategies for dealing with the world because it, uh, when it comes to cybersecurity, because it thinks that it is very, very difficult to deter attacks. And instead, it uh, chooses a certain strategic coyness, a certain strategic willingness, unwillingness rather, to uh, communicate, to talk about what it will and will not do, in order to try and maximize its options and the case that it is attacked. So deterrence typically involves the generation of clear understandings where you know if you attack me in this way, this bad thing is going to happen to you. Where the United States under current circumstances, it uh, instead is ambiguous about what it's going to do because it wants to preserve the maximum amount of freedom that it uh, possibly can. It does have rules of uh, engagement, uh, which are intended to make sure that uh, different parts of the military don't get, get in over their heads by uh, doing things that they shouldn't do, but it doesn't talk about what these rules of engagement are, uh, it doesn't even hint at what they uh, contain. Instead, the United States does its best to appear big and threatening while recognizing that this probably isn't going to go very, very far. Now, there are people who think that uh, the United States policy here is mistaken, who think that deterrence is much more plausible. Uh, than the uh, current consensus in the United States is. Lindsay, whose reading is assigned this week, is one of those people, but uh, he is uh, very much a minority viewpoint on this stuff. That tells us about the uh, broad defense deterrence uh, part of things. How do we think about active offense? Well, here, this is something which is changing. So the United States has recently started to talk about defending Ford as a key concept, and more or less what it wants to do here more and more is it wants to attack possible, um, possible adversaries 
and to degrade their systems as best as possible in order to make it harder for them to attack the United States. We know that this is uh, currently the topic of much debate, but since uh, most of these activities happen in the classified space where it's very, very hard to know what is going on, it's uh, somewhat difficult to know exactly what it means in practice. We know that the United States also is, as I say, a highly aggressive character in uh, international uh, cybersecurity. Other countries view it as being uh, extremely aggressive and they worry about the way in which the United States tries to break into their systems. So there's a lot of uh, probing, uh, uh, a lot of attacks, uh, years of which sometimes are espionage, they sometimes are efforts to try and degrade other uh, actors' equipment, and sometimes uh, perhaps uh, the uh, actual attackers, the United States or whoever, doesn't know what they're going to do until they actually get into a system and see what the possibilities are. And we have seen some situations in which this has had important consequences, and perhaps the most important example of that is the so-called Stuxnet, uh, which is the popular name, or Olympic Games, which appears to be the code word, attack upon Iran's nuclear program, which I mentioned in passing a few weeks ago when we did the uh, when we talked about nuclear proliferation. The background to this program, and it's worth talking about in some detail is that the United States was extremely worried about Iran's nuclear program, and it was worried for two reasons. First of all, it was worried that Iran was going to uh, possibly get nuclear weapons in ways which might pl plausibly destabilize the Middle East. Secondly, it worried that Israel, which was of course, uh, is of course the United States' major ally in the Middle East, that Israel might mount a uh, preemptive attack upon Iran to stop Iran from getting nuclear weapons, uh, which whether it succeeded or failed, could cause other states to declare war upon Israel and could plunge the Middle East into a major international crisis. So the United States, uh, during the period of the uh, last year or so of the Bush administration and the first couple of years of the Obama administration, was trying to figure out how to deal with this major problem. And the way that they did this was that they pulled in the Israelis into trying to create a joint cyber program, which was intended to uh, degrade the Iranian nuclear, uh, Iranian nuclear program without a direct physical attack, which would have been uh, visible aggression, which could have had all sorts of unfortunate consequences. So the United States and the Israel collaborated in the so-called Olympic Games program, which was intended to attack the Iranian nuclear program and developed a set of uh, related offensive tools. These tools have got names like, um, like uh, Stuxnet, like Dooku, Flame, uh, which uh, you know, they were intended for a variety of different purposes. Uh, some of them were intended uh, to uh, map out the Iranian nuclear program, which is what we'll talk about, uh, talk about in great detail. Some were intended to uh, map out the financial transactions, which allowed Iran to buy in supplies. And some of them were intended, uh, once vulnerabilities had been discovered, to exploit these vulnerabilities in a covert action aimed at making it more difficult for Iran to complete uh, the nuclear weapon cycle. As a recap, you will remember that to refine uranium, and this is what Iran was trying to do, was its primary route uh, to uh, nuclear weapons, uh, you need thousands of extremely sensitive centrifuges spinning at very high speed to separate out the uranium-235, which is the isotope that you need in order to create a nuclear bomb. Now, this is an extremely sensitive, extremely difficult process. Iran was able to do this because they had bought the technology from a, a Pakistani nuclear scientist who uh, sold it to a number of actors in a, a, a number of actors in the uh, uh, in, in the world who were prepared to uh, pay him money. Now it turned out, however, that one of the other actors who he sold this technology to was Libya. And Libya uh, wanted to uh, make peace with the United States. It abandoned its nuclear program, and among other things, it provided the United States with some of the centrifuges that it had been using uh, potentially in order to refine uranium-235 itself. And so this then provided the possibility for the United States to run tests in order to try and figure out what kinds of attacks might destabilize these centrifuges and make them work badly. So this, that was then, this was then combined with information that was gathered by spyware. 
So the United States managed to inject spyware into the Iranian computers that they were using to run the system, to run the system of centrifuges, and the spyware mapped out the controllers and figured out and sort of uh, where where the uh, controlling computers, the Siemens controllers were, how they connected to uh, the uh, various centrifuges, and it allowed you, in a sense, to map out the system and to observe the system over a period of weeks and months and figure out how it worked. And then the fact that they had these centrifuges, these physical centrifuges, allowed them to design a specific tool, which came to be called Stuxnet, that could be tested against those centrifuges to see if it worked and to see, for example, if it could destabilize them by uh, spinning them up really quickly and then bringing them to a sudden crashing halt. Stuxnet into the uh, Iranian uh, Stuxnet was then injected into the Iranian system, uh, allegedly using compromised U USB drives. Nobody is quite sure what the story is as to how Stuxnet was injected into the system. And after it had monitored uh, months of communication, a normal operation, and somehow gotten this information back to the mothership in the United States so that the United States could figure out what to do, uh, the United States began to send it into action. So as I say, it started to spin up the centrifuges really fast and then stop them suddenly in order to uh, uh, destroy them. And it kept on uh, generating all of these fake signals within the system, saying that even when this was happening, the centrifuges were uh, working at normal speed, uh, that the centrifuges were working well, in order to try and create as much confusion as possible, and uh, trying to uh, vary the attacks, creating various, quote, modalities of attack, as David Sanger, uh, who is a journalist who's uh, looked at this, describes it, in order to confuse the Iranians and to upset them. So part of the idea here was to make it physically more difficult for them to uh, continue to build the system. Part of the idea also was to try and create confusion and disarray and uh, uh, disagreement. And indeed, it looks like the uh, Iranians, uh, uh, they fired various people. Uh, they may have suspected various people of working deliberately to sabotage the arrangements. Uh, they uh, effectively found also sort of the uh, human resources part of this also created created some important uh, confusion. Now, there is disagreement as to whether this was overall effective. So we see, for example, David Sanger, uh, who was reporting on the basis of interviews he performed with a US general who was involved in the process, suggesting that it was very successful indeed. We see some observers, such as Lindsay, suggesting that it was not so effective. I think most people think that it was at least somewhat effective and that it uh, plausibly delayed the Iranian program by a number of months, perhaps uh, by a couple of years even, uh, if you're extremely optimistic, which was uh, perhaps enough that uh, it was then possible to start applying the sanctions that we have discussed in order to uh, bring the Iranians to the negotiating table by other means. So this is the one crucial example that we have <coughs> of how it is that a covert a uh, covert cyber attack has worked during peacetime. We have much, much less evidence of how it works during wartime. There's a little bit that you can garner from attacks that were mounted during the uh, brief war that we saw between, uh, the, uh, between uh, Georgia and uh, Russia. Uh, this was a uh, very brief period of hostilities, but it's very, very unclear very difficult to uh, tell exactly what was going on. And in any event, this happened a long time ago at a period when cyber attack capabilities were relatively, were relatively weak. So this has led to a lot of speculation as to whether or not the United States is extremely vulnerable to some kind of a Pearl Harbor attack. There is a lot of talk, there's been a lot of talk for a while, about how the United States might be uh, hit by a cyber Pearl Harbor, which effectively here stands as a code word for a sneak attack that is completely devastating, that would lead to uh, a major, major degradation of the United States' ability to uh, function. And so the idea here is very straightforward. The idea is that the United States is an incredibly open and an incredibly technology dependent uh, economy and political system. And this means that it has a lot of vulnerabilities which uh, can be exploited and which are really difficult to defend for the reasons that we have already discussed. And then the second part of the argument is that because it is relatively straightforward to put together offensive attacks, because it is relatively cheap, to hire hackers and to give them coffee and to let them loose, 
that it would be possible, even perhaps through relatively small states, to mount a very aggressive operations against the United States. And then the implication is that cybersecurity becomes a power equalizer, that it becomes a new technology which changes the game, so that the United States, which has prided itself on the power of its military, prided itself on uh, maintaining dominance, military dominance of the world, could suddenly find itself vulnerable to attack, not even from a uh, regional power such as Russia, but perhaps even from a much smaller state than that, or maybe even, even from some kind of uh, terrorist organization or another, which could uh, mount cyber attacks that could have major consequences. They could mount cyber attacks that could damage the internet, that could take down the communications networks, could take down the financial networks that the United States needs in order to transfer money, could attack dams and factories which have SCADA systems, which are systems which are automated, and uh, for example, uh, get dams to uh, break down, get factories to pump to toxic sludge into rivers or to, uh, to uh, misbehave in other ways, and perhaps also could disable the power generation system. Uh, there are various vulnerabilities uh, that you could overload in the power system, which could have cascading consequences so that uh, you could uh, take out, according to some of the more pessimistic accounts, you could take out the entire US power system for weeks and for months. So this then uh, sounds like a very scary thing. We have, however, some plausible reasons, and here again the Lindsay article is interesting, thinking that the uh, pessimism may be a little overdone, because the pessimists tend to emphasize the availability of means, they talk about the vulnerabilities, they talk about the ability to exploit, uh, exploit these vulnerabilities, but they don't think about what attackers might be able to do from doing this, and what benefits they could gain. And here we have some reason to suspect that perhaps they might not be able to gain all that much from this. Lindsay argues that uh, if a, another state tried to mount some kind of a warlike cyber attack on the United States, it would not achieve very much. It would effectively make the United States very, very angry without causing the United States to want to back down on anything. Uh, because cyber, first of all, it's very bad for making threats because you want to keep it secret. You don't want it to be easy that you, easy for the uh, attacked actor to figure out that it was you who did it, which then makes it very, very hard to use the threat of cyber attacks in order to get concessions. It's also hard to use cyber attacks to cow civilian populations. It turns out that civilian populations are prepared to put up with a variety of unhappinesses and inconveniences if they believe that they are in a wartime scenario and that it's necessary to national survival. Uh, it is, there are people who say that it is going to be harder to degrade the infrastructure than uh, some of the more pessimistic accounts would suggest, that the infrastructure may be relatively robust. And so then the argument is that this is only useful in two different scenarios. First, it might be useful for covered action, and here we have the scenario of how Stuxnet is a uh, potentially successful ex example of how you can use a cyber attack as a covered action against some specific activity, some specific thing that you think is a threat in and of itself, and this can uh, indeed be uh, useful, uh, or else it can be useful as part of a broader military campaign. And, the, and, and, and here the implication of this is as follows. Uh, you know, so now we'll talk about this in, in more detail. The implication is that cyber security, cyber attacks, are probably not going to be particularly effective unless they go hand in hand with broader, more physical, more traditional physical attacks. And we'll explain why this is in a moment. First of all, however, I want to point to, point to what the implication of this is which is that if Lindsay is right, and these are all arguments taken from Lindsay, then cyber offensive operations are not going to be a great leveler. They're not going to be able to make small powers operate at the same level as great powers. Instead, what they're going to tend to do is to reinforce the strengths of those who are already militarily powerful. Uh, that cybersecurity is kind of like it's a force enhancer rather than a weapon in its own right. It is not a substitute for physical attacks. You cannot achieve the same kinds of things with cyber that you can with physical attacks. And 
If, if this is true, if it instead enhances the power of those who are already powerful, then this effectively stabilizes the existing international system and is not a game changer which allows for new, uh, new powers to come up from beneath and to upset the apple cart in their own favor. So why is it that cyber might be thought of as being a uh, complement to traditional physical force rather than a game changer? Uh, so if you want to think about this, you want to think about how cyber might work in an actual, uh, actual shooting war. And here the argument is relatively straightforward, which is that if you think about cyber attacks, cyber attack can be temporarily devastating. They can temporarily take out an enemy's uh, information systems, an enemy's communication systems, an enemy's ability to see what is happening in the world up through radar or through other advanced systems. All of these are uh, sophisticated electronic systems which may turn out to be vulnerable to cyber attacks. However, it is going to plausibly be very hard for you to use a cyber attack to disable an enemy for very long. Uh, if you uh, use a, a cyber attack to take down an enemy's communication systems, the enemy probably is going to be able to figure out pretty quickly what it is that you have done and to uh, figure out ways to fix the vulnerability or perhaps to move to some more primitive form of communication which is less readily disrupted. Uh, similarly, uh, if you try to take down a radar system or whatever, you'll probably be able to do that for a period if you have a, a sophisticated attack, but it will also be possible for the adversary probably to reboot the radar systems and to do so in a way uh, that will allow them to identify and to uh, eliminate the vulnerability that has been used against them. So this then suggests that you can have temporary, you can have extreme temporary effects with cybersecurity, but no more. And this obviously suggests that on its own then, cyber is going to be no more than annoyance. You can uh, make it difficult for your enemy to communicate for a couple of days, but that's about it. But then if you combine that, and this is the point that Lindsay makes, if you could, uh, where this can be devastating is if you have not only sufficient cyber power, but sufficient traditional physical power that you can do a one-two punch. So you use the cyber power to uh, take out your enemy's communication systems, their ability to see the world, and while your enemy is reeling, during that temporary period of confusion, you then are able to mount a devastating physical attack against key assets of your adversary. This is something that you can do in order to give yourself a... Uh, you know, so you're using a cyber to give yourself a temporary but substantial advantage that you can then use to enhance the uh, effect uh, greatly, enhance greatly the effectiveness of your physical attack upon your adversary. You can also do other things. You can play with your adversary's heads. You can damage your adversary's confidence in their information systems by injecting fake information, by degrading the uh, communication systems to a point where the enemy suspects that it has been degraded but it isn't sure. There are all sorts of things that you can do. But in general, cyber operations are going to be a support function for a conventional military attacks rather than something which is a major new form of attack in and of itself. So this tells us all about the standard notions of cyber. But there are a new set of issues that have cropped up over the last few years and became particularly prominent in 2016, which is the uh, new kinds of offensive operations which were mounted by Russia against the United States. There had been other offensive operations like this mounted uh, also by Russia in other states before, in Ukraine and elsewhere. But this was uh, something which really came home to the United States in a very forcible way, thanks to the relative degree of success that Russia had in uh, creating confusion and creating this may during the 2016 elections. And so what was Russia trying to do? It was not engaged in, in a traditional military mission. It was not looking to uh, spy. It was not the, in the traditional sense of trying to figure out what its opponents were doing. It was not trying to degrade the United States military capabilities, which were too well protected. Instead, it was trying to uh, play havoc with the United States, uh, with the United States uh, political system. And it did so through combining three different tools. First of all, it was able to engage in traditional hacking of various servers, uh, servers in particular belonging to the DNC, the Democratic National Committee, 
somebody uh, stupidly, and this is a, a, you know, a, a pretty extraordinary story, uh, more or less what happened is somebody sent a, somebody got a phishing email, that is an email connecting to a bogus link, which uh, compromised their password uh, protections. They get this email, they uh, contact the uh, computer security people working for the DNC, they ask is this email a problem. The DNC responds to them in an ambiguous way, which uh, they think says, no, it's not a problem, so they click through, and they compromise the entire email system, allowing Russia then to uh, grab up lots of sensitive emails, which it is then able to release in order to try and, uh, to try and uh, create political havoc and consternation. It combines this with a social media operation, so it creates a lot of fake social media identities on Facebook, on Twitter, elsewhere, and it tries to use these both to amplify the uh, uh, the, the stuff that is, uh, it has released, the sense of political information, to try and get journalists to become inf interested in this political information, and also to try and stir up tensions between different groups using social media. So that if you, for example, look at a Twitter debate between Black Lives Matters and conservatives, you will see that the Twitter debates there, there is a very, it's a very polarized debate, under, uh, uh, understandably. You get, uh, a not, you, you get a lot of people within Black Lives Matters, you get a, a lot of people uh, within conservatism, and you don't get all that much in the way of meaningful debate or dialogue between these two different groups. But inside each of these groups, you find there are Russian compromised uh, accounts which are doing everything that they can to try and stir up tensions, to try and stir up disagreements on both sides of this political dispute, more or less in the hope that the more that they can polarize debate, polarize American society, the, uh, the uh, more that they can hurt the ability of the United States to, uh, to uh, in any way um, sort of interfere with Russia. And finally, Russia also probes and possibly wants to subvert various online voter registration databases. Uh, this is something where uh, we are not quite sure still what Russia was intending to do. There are two plausible theories. One is that they were uh, investigating whether or not they could actually try to degrade these databases and to degrade this data in a sense to uh, try and uh, destabilize elections. The more plausible uh, uh, interpretation though, I think, is that they weren't necessarily trying to destabilize the elections as such by injecting, for example, fake information. They were instead trying to create increased distrust in the results of the elections by making it clear that these elections uh, could be hacked. They were on vulnerable websites in the presumption that if uh, they presumed that uh, President Trump, uh, they presumed that Trump was going to lose, they presumed that Hillary Clinton was going to win, and so uh, one of the plausible theories, uh, given how various Russian hacking identities like Gucci for 2.0 were behaving, is that what they wanted to do was as soon as the election was called, they expected uh, that Trump would say that the election had, uh, had been run unfairly, that uh, they had been cheating, and then they would, uh, the, these hacked accounts would provide information that suggested that yes, these uh, the you know these election sites were vulnerable and try to make it out as if the Democrats had hacked them. So effectively, what they were doing was they're trying to, to create as much distrust and confusion and fear and paranoia as they at all possibly could. Now this turns to all be stuff that is really hard to figure out how to counter using conventional cybersecurity, because even more than traditional attacks, it's really hard to deter. So think about uh, the efforts uh, that we have seen since these uh, things happened. We have seen some action which has been taken by the United States against Russia, uh, some punishment of Russia for its involvement in these attacks, but this punishment has been pretty tiny. It has not been enough to uh, plausibly deter Russia. It is more the United States doing this so that they can say that it is responding, that it is retaliating, than doing so in the expectation that this retaliation will be taken very seriously by its targets. And the reason for this is very straightforward. First of all, it's very, very hard to uh, get agreement in order to take strong action against Russia when uh, the uh, attacks are seen, when discussion of the attacks are seen by the president as potentially being an attack on his own legitimacy and on the legitimacy of his election. Uh, this then makes it very, very difficult for the United States to uh, coordinate upon a unified, strong response against uh, these Russian attacks. 
Furthermore, there is a uh, feeling that uh, sort of the, if the United States gets into this kind of a fight with Russia, that uh, Russia could retaliate further, and even if the United States retaliates back, that at a certain point Russia is just going to, it cares less, and it has less valuable targets than the United States does, and so hence, uh, at a certain point, Russia is going to be able to hurt the United States in this game more than the United States is going to be able to hurt Russia. So in a sense, then, uh, Russia has what people call in uh, uh, deterrence, it has escalation dominance. Uh, that uh, as you continue to escalate, at a certain point, the United States is just going to shrug its shoulders and decide that, uh, uh, that, that escalation is just getting too costly. And that bo if both the United States and Russia know this, that it probably doesn't make sense to go down that road in the first place, because everybody knows that the United States is going to end up losing. It's also it's extremely difficult to defend against these kinds of attacks, uh, because these are the trade-offs of having a relatively open political system, uh, that uh, open political systems, open communication systems, can be uh, engineered in these ways. And finally, it is really difficult to use deterrence by denial. How do you blunt these kinds of attacks? How do you try to deter uh, outside actors from uh, using these kinds of attacks uh, by saying that the uh, system is uh, not vulnerable against them, when very clearly the system is quite vulnerable to these kinds of uh, compromises? So this then leads to the debate that I'm going to close with, which is between Goldsmith and Russell, Russell on the one side and Farrell and Schneier on the other. So Goldsmith and Russell, Russell argue effectively that this tells us some important things about how the world is not the way that the United States thought that it was. So Goldsmith and Russell, uh, Goldsmith for a long time, has criticized the United States' approach to the internet, has criticized the United States' belief that the internet is this incredibly open system that is going to result in uh, dictatorships becoming democracies and uh, people rising up and uh, dissidents being empowered and all of these things. And uh, Goldsmith has been very skeptical about this for a long, long time, and he suggests effectively that this provides proof that his skepticism was warranted. That all of this open internet that the uh, United States has championed over decades, that this has effectively combined with the inherent openness of the United States political and economic system, it has combined in order to uh, turn what appeared to be strengths of the United States into vulnerabilities. So this is effectively what he and Russell argue. They argue that uh, when we are in a world where Russia can mount these kinds of attacks, that we see that the digital connectedness, that the global internet that the uh, United States did so much to create, uh, this turns into a set of vulnerabilities for the United States. It turns into a set of uh, openings that Russia can use in order to uh, quickly and easily get access to US communications. So if you think about uh, the world 40 or 50 years ago, before the internet was a major thing, uh, for Russia, in order to, if Russia wanted to really be able to uh, shape debate in the United States, uh, or if the USSR, its, uh, its predecessor, it would have had to have bought newspapers or, uh, or TV stations or whatever, which would have been extremely difficult during the Cold War. Uh, it, it tried to do this using front organizations, of course, uh, but it found that it was very, very difficult to achieve any, choke, uh, any foothold even in uh, debate within the United States. But when we are in a world of the internet, it turns out that it's very, very easy and very straightforward for, the, uh, for Russia, very simply as it did uh, for some of its operations, simply just to pay Facebook to uh, try to, uh, you know, to, to send certain kinds of ads to certain kinds of people. And this gives us a second reason why US strengths have become vulnerabilities. The United States has created all these platform companies which are, uh, they are legally protected from uh, any liability for, for, for what their uh, various, uh, various users do. And these platform companies have created these vast automated systems so that everything is run automatically, so that uh, advertising and content is run automatically, and these systems can be gamed. It turns out, as I say, that it's very easy and very cheap, uh, or at least was cheap and easy for Russia back then, to run these uh, advertising campaigns, to set up these fake, uh, uh, these fake Facebook pages, 
all of these things which were effectively taking advantage of these vast platforms which had been created by United States media companies and which had been seen as an extraordinary source of strength for the United States that it was effectively uh, running the media platforms that run the world, but these media platforms turned out to be an enormous political liability. And the final problem, from Goldsmith and Russell's perspective, is that free speech becomes an attack vector. If you have a society such as the United States that allows relatively liberal free speech, that this free speech can then be weaponized and can then be used to inject falsehoods and nonsense and uh, in addition to uh, uh, genuinely uh, true information which uh, can be weaponized such as the uh, information from the hacking, all of this provides an attack vector which has important consequences. So the implications that they draw is that the United States is faced with a fundamental set of trade-offs, that it thought that its own openness and the openness of global networks reinforced each other, created all these benefits for the United States, enhanced US power, and instead what they have done is the uh, intersection of the openness of the global uh, internet and the openness of US society have created a whole set of vulnerabilities, according to Goldsmith and Russell, that are being exploited by uh, outside actors and are being exploited in order to degrade United States democracy and make it more difficult for US democracy to work as it is supposed to work. Farrell and Schneier, in contrast, disagree. So they, uh, instead, they suggest that the uh, way in which Goldsmith and Russell think is too much dominated by a national security perspective. And from a national security perspective, it's very hard to think about openness as anything but a security flaw. If you're thinking about this, you know, if you are a uh, person in the US military, plausibly you're going to want to have as much control over information about your capabilities as possible because you do not want to give any information to the enemy. Uh, that is not part of your job. But Farrell and Schneier suggest that if you are instead trying to run a democracy, you need to have some kind of openness as part and parcel of the system. So they suggest that instead of thinking about the world in this kind of a national security way, we should think about it in the same way as computer security people do. So you have computer security uh, experts who try to secure information systems. They think about, they think about uh, information systems, servers, or whatever, and they think about all the trade-offs in those information systems. Because if you make an information fully secure, if you make a system fully secure so that uh, no outside actor who, with bad intentions can access it, you're almost certainly going to be making it so secure that it's going to be completely or nearly unusable for legitimate users as well. So what you want to do is you want to think about trade-offs and you want to think about mitigation. You want to think about how it is you know, that you can come at some kind of compromise between the openness that you need to some degree to make a system usable and the, uh, and the ways in which you want to make sure that, this, uh, that you minimize without ever plausibly being able to completely elim eliminate the ways in which these uh, open channels can be used by bad actors. So Farrell and Schneier point to the way in which uh, computer security people, they have all of these interesting concepts such as the attack surface. The attack surface is more or less the bundle of vulnerabilities that can be, uh, can be exploited by a given attacker. And they talk also about the threat models uh, which are, uh, you know, so the threat models are how you think about who are the likely attackers who are going to come up against you, what capabilities do they have, what resources do they have, what access do they have, and what goals do they have in wanting to attack the system. And so Farrell and Schneier work this through, and they argue that you can start to think about mitigating these problems. They say, we want to think about democracy as being an information system writ large, and they give some rough ideas about how democracies and autocracies differ from each other as information systems. And based on this, they uh, suggest effectively some ways in which you might want to start minimizing the attack surface of democracy, that is minimizing the set of vulnerabilities that are uh, plausibly most open to attack without at the same time compromising too much of the openness that helps the United States work as an open uh, democratic system. And they argue that this involves, for example, securing elections, that there is a lot that you can do to make election systems more robust against uh, interference. 
uh, there are a variety of possible uh, reforms that would involve actually by and large moving away from electronic voting towards physical voting and some uh, a random auditing. They talk about a product reg regulation, how it is that you might want to create a reform US liability law so that uh, various products uh, that are uh, fundamentally insecure, uh, that their manufacturers would have incentives to make them uh, more secure. They uh, suggest uh, in other work that you might want to think about tackling e-commerce monopolies, that the reason why platform companies are such a threat to uh, security is because they have been allowed to grow too big and too uncontrolled. And finally, they suggest a variety of political reforms. And then when they think about threat models, they suggest that you should think about this not just in terms of Russian hackers. The thinking about Russian hackers and about outside interference in general is uh, to misunderstand the problem. Because a lot of the problem is plausibly going to come from insider actors too. Insider actors who are capable of using some of these same techniques of misinformation, of uh, trying to flood the zone with nonsense uh, and with uh, confusion in order to make it hard for people to co cooperate and coordinate and in order to make it hard for democracy to work. But all of these things can be done much, much better by inside actors within the United States who understand the vulnerabilities of the United States electoral system then they can be done by outsiders such as Russian hackers, and that we can also think about the intersection between the two. How it is, for example, that a Russian hackers might be able to, uh, to enhance the efforts of, uh, of, uh, uh, and the disagreements within the country and the uh, efforts of uh, various actors to engage in dishonesty by uh, trying to, uh, by trying to uh, increase its uh, visibility uh, and how you know, sort of insiders and outsiders might, uh, sort of, without necessarily actively colluding with each other, tacitly work towards many of the same ends. And they suggest that this is a really important new a uh, new agenda for research and for policy to really understand how all of this works. So, putting all of this together to food, what we can say is that cybersecurity is an important new area of security, but is an area that we can understand in part by looking at through old lenses, and in particular through understanding how deterrence, how defense, how uh, deterrence through denial, how all of these different concepts may have purchased and may help explain why cybersecurity is uh, something that is relatively difficult for the United States to, uh, it's difficult for it to secure itself in cyberspace. And it also is interesting, we can begin to start thinking more systematically about some debates. So uh, many people think that cybersecurity is going to have a broad destabilizing impact on power politics because it makes it cheaper for uh, small powers to uh, be able to gear themselves up so that they can play on something like the same playing field as big powers do. And deterrence uh, is going to be hard. We're in an offense dominant world. Offense and defense are difficult to distinguish. So uh, there is a lot of emphasis on how this can create instability. But there are also ways in which cybersecurity, to the extent that it is more important in uh, enhancing the ability of existing military powers to uh, project their force, that it may have stabilizing rather than destabilizing consequences from the perspective of the United States. But also, there's some reason to believe that cybersecurity attacks may not be nearly as important outside of actual shooting wars as people expect, that there probably isn't all that much point in for an adversary in destabilizing the US power grid, uh, even if it is able to, uh, because it just doesn't uh, provide any plausible adversary with much in the way of plausible benefits. Uh, all it will do is get the United States really, really quite mad with them. Uh, but that, uh, despite this, we can see how cybersecurity can be important in wartime situations uh, very plausibly, although again, we don't have any very good physical evidence of that to date because we have yet to see a major war fought with cybersecurity as a substantial component. And it can also have uh, some uh, benefits for covert action. And finally, we talked a little bit about these new sets of questions, uh, which are really emerging debates still, about the vulnerabilities of democracy to certain kinds of cyber attacks, 
efforts to mitigate, and whether or not uh, the uh, openness of democracy is a good thing and it's something that can be made reasonably robust in a world of cyber threats, or whether alternatively it is something that creates fundamental, profound, and lasting and enduring vulnerabilities for the United States and other societies like the United States. So thank you very much all for listening. Thank you very much all for being part of the course and uh, best of luck to you uh, as you go forward. Thank you.